questions one and two. You will hear a tutor and some students discussing science and ethics. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one and two. And answer questions one and two. In the 19th century, scientific discoveries took a long time to produce any actual applications, and scientists might have had a case for giving little thought to the social or environmental impact of their work. That all changed in the 20th century, with the huge advances first in physics and then in biology. Science started to play a much more important role in our lives, and the relationship between scientists and society became much closer. Many scientists became increasingly concerned about the ethics of what they were doing, as they quickly saw the consequences. The benefits, such as vastly improved crop yields and the eradication of diseases like bubonic plague. But also terrible damage in the form of pollution and chemical weapons. Yes, but some scientists still claim even today that their only duty is to make public the findings of their research. They need to do that, of course. But I think the key points are that they ought to stop making any distinction between pure science and applied science, because in practical terms, it no longer exists. And also, they must accept full responsibility for the consequences of their work. Now listen and answer questions three to ten. Now listen and answer questions three to ten. Let's explore that last point a little further. How can scientists put that responsibility into practice? By educating the public, particularly through the media and at the workplace.、Mm -hmm. Another thing they must do is advise on what might one day go wrong as a result of what they're coming up with now. That seems essential, and just as importantly, if and when things do go wrong. They need to sort them out, especially where the fault lies with the original research.、Mm. How do you feel about the international role of scientists, given that their work crosses frontiers so readily? I think it gives them, or at least should give them, a global view. In this respect, some of them are better placed than many politicians to see how new discoveries are likely to affect particular parts of the world. But will the politicians listen?、Mm, probably not. But I'm not suggesting getting involved with politics or politicians. Much better to raise the public's awareness of scientific issues so they can put the pressure on at election time. There's a problem here, though, isn't there, with the way the public sees scientists? They're all either mad or bad. <laughs> That's something they need to work on, definitely. To regain public trust, they'll have to show they're accountable, and that science is about improving people's lives. That may not be so easy. What do you think are the areas in science that really worry people these days? Science in agriculture, above all.、Mm -hmm. There's been all this media hysteria about Frankenstein foods, but there is a genuine issue here. Whether adding specific genes to plants is a valid way of increasing food production, or whether it risks the appearance of new diseases, of superweeds and pests, which links it to another controversy: using chemicals to control pests. And that's something else that was at first thought to be harmless, but we now know that the careless spraying of crops has led to all kinds of health problems for people. Plus, a devastating loss of biodiversity, with huge numbers of insects, birds, and mammals simply disappearing from the countryside, fish dying in poisoned rivers, and so on.、Mm -hmm. And of course, if we're talking about death on a massive scale, then we have to mention the role of science in enabling the military to wage 
chemical and biological and nuclear warfare, which has destroyed life in so many parts of the world. Okay, I think we've identified some major topics there. There's something I'd like to add, if I may.、Mm-hmm. Sure, it's important for scientists and future scientists to talk about major issues like these, but we might also want to look at what we can do or not do in our everyday lives. Particularly as many of us will be earning more money than we actually need for basic necessities. I'm thinking here of things like burning fossil fuels by driving everywhere. What do you think? Well, something that scientists seem to do rather too often is take planes to distant places, which is highly damaging environmentally.、Mm. For instance, to attend conferences on subjects like the disappearing ozone layer. <laughs> When nowadays they could probably stay at work and use a video conferencing link anyway, which may in fact be an example of how progress in computer science. Can impact positively on the environment. But going back to harmful things,、mm. what else can be done? Again, on the air transport theme, there are the huge distances a lot of consumer goods travel before they actually reach the shops in this country. This seems another extreme waste of energy, especially if much of what is being produced and carried is packaging. Perhaps it's worth shopping for more locally produced items. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university. The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job, and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently, and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list. So for you, it's best to plan ahead. And be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are: Are there enough toilet facilities, and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier-free, so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of 
is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible, and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you, within reason, of course. Most companies do recognise that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organised and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. Okay, are there any questions before we move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organizer in their busy conference center, organizing and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment, and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at nine a.m., so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at ten a.m. And then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company, which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3:30 p.m., and after that, you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning, we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this, and it'll leave from outside the refectory. At 8 a.m., you'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. This event will take place in the main hall next to the library. And it'll run from 10:30 until 4. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. 
Part 3 You will hear a phone conversation giving information about a health and fitness centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello. Hello. Is that Ms Heidi Jones? Yes. Good morning, Ms Jones. I'd like to take a few minutes of your time to tell you about the Seven Oaks Health and Fitness Centre, which is in your suburb. Would that be convenient? OK. Well, the centre's not far from you. It's on the corner of Marion Street and Giles Street and has a large car park. It's open every day of the week, opening on weekdays at 6am and at 9am at the weekend. It closes at 9.30pm Monday to Friday and on Saturday at 4pm and Sunday at 2pm. We also have childcare Monday to Saturday from 9 in the morning until midday for a small extra charge. So you can leave your children in safe hands while you attend one of our classes or perhaps have a swim or if you just want to relax in the spa and sauna or steam room. Talking of classes, we have a very wide range which are designed to suit all different levels of fitness and individual needs. I mentioned the pool just now. Well, in addition to swimming laps or just relaxing, we also offer aqua aerobic classes, which are 45 minute classes that use the therapeutic effects of water. This provides a very safe and effective exercise and is suitable for all fitness levels, as well as being a lot of fun. Many people who haven't been exercising for a while start in the aqua classes, as do people who need to take care after hospital surgery, for example. These classes are very popular and are scheduled every weekday, Monday to Friday, and on Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning. Another very popular activity in the pool area is learning to swim and these swimming classes are held at 4pm every weekday and in the mornings at the weekend. By the way, they're open to both adults and children of any age. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, it would take too much of your time to tell you in detail about all our programs as we have a very wide range of activities at different times. However, I'll just outline some of them. Our super circuit classes are extremely popular and you get a good aerobic workout while toning your muscles. They're easy to learn as you combine using hydraulic equipment with exercises guaranteed to give you a good cardio workout. The teachers are very good and there's a fun atmosphere. And the classes are very effective in assisting weight loss, relieving stress, lowering blood pressure and generally increasing fitness. Oh, and I haven't mentioned our range of aerobic and step classes of different types which suit all levels. Our specially designed aerobics room holds over 55 people and our highly qualified and trained staff can advise you as to which class might suit you. We are inviting you to a free one week trial period when you can come and try any of the classes or activities 
before you make the decision to join. By the way, there is also a large and very well equipped gym where we offer free fitness assessments and you can have an individual program designed just for you. Also, the cardiovascular room has the latest range of machines which help you burn fat, increase your fitness or just warm up. They are very popular as you can forget all about the calorie burning by watching your favourite music videos on TV while you exercise. Right now we have a very special new member joining fee offer which allows two memberships for the price of one, a real bargain. So if you can, bring along a friend who'd like to get fit as well in time for summer. Come along and try us out. You can meet the staff. Try out some of the classes for a week, absolutely free. And then, if you like us, sign up for only $110 each for six months. Thanks for taking the time to learn about the centre and I hope we'll see you there soon, Heidi. I'll put one of our brochures in the mail for you right now. Bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a media studies tutor giving a lecture about news sources. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35. Okay, now many of you will have heard about the predicted death of newspapers as people increasingly access the TV and the Internet for their news. Today, I want to look at the USA, which has very advanced news sources, to see if this is actually true. In the USA, the main news sources without doubt are TV, the Internet, and the press. That is traditional newspapers. And although they are each surviving and growing, they are also changing. Obviously, TV news has been around for a while, and the early evening bulletins, when people get in from work, are very popular. I suppose we traditionally think of the morning newspaper arriving on our doorstep with the daily news, Interestingly, this is not borne out by the statistics which show that readership in the U.S. is much higher when people have time to relax, when they're not working, especially on Sundays. The Internet is also a popular weekend activity, but shows no variation with weekday access. So people are using the different sources in different ways. Interestingly, local radio has been hit less by the grip of quite strong local newspapers than by the Internet, which is seen to offer a better regional service. But just because the Internet is seen as the new force in news media does not mean it is dominant. Television has, of course, been global for a while. But now, technological changes, which have fueled the rise of online news, 
have also allowed newspapers to print and distribute editions across the world. In fact, Internet news, which is seen as the big competitor for traditional markets, does not offer that much variety. Often, the sources are the online versions of the newspapers, whereas television, in order to offer something different, has had to come up with a much more mixed bag of reporting, from hard news to light reports on celebrity events. Another issue is reliability. The Internet is virtually unregulated, so anything can be reported there, whether true or not. Journalists on newspapers have fought a long, hard battle to fight intervention and to retain the freedom of the press. Television, however, is seen as critical to political power and has become subject to harsh controls about what it can or cannot say. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. Now, one very critical factor in keeping newspapers alive and well in the USA has been their approach to advertising. Obviously, newspapers are heavily dependent on advertising revenue, and they have become more and more imaginative in what they offer, in order to make sure that advertisers use them and not other news sources. This has meant that, contrary to popular belief, Newspapers now have a significantly higher profit margin than the rest of American industry. So, how have they managed to raise advertising revenue in this way? Well, they have put a lot of effort into developing and maintaining a very strong association with the retail trade. And they've come up with a winner. A critical tool in their sales plan has been suggesting that the adverts they run can have vouchers. This has been enormously effective because they have found that not only do more people buy the paper to get the discounts, but also that this inevitably means much higher sales for the clients who advertised. As well as doing this, the newspapers have also introduced aggressive sales campaigns over the last few years. This has resulted in a significant and continuing rise in the number of advertisers prepared to pay the extra for full-page ads. So, what I would like to move on to... That is the end of Part 4.